broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org, and by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com. And welcome back to this week at the State House as this session of the General Assembly continues to go forward. Senate has been dealing with, um, some call it Affordable Care Act, some call it Obamacare, some call it nullification. Anyway, it was some hot debate and that bill got disposed of. Over in the House, they of course have finished the budget. The budget is now over in the Senate and in the Senate Finance Committee as this session moves along. We'll get a chance in the coming days to see where the Senate wants to go in terms of uh, what it considers to be pressing issues. And that's some of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we've got a great program, but, but before I start, let me take care of some housekeeping. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Time Warner Cable and the South Carolina Farm Bureau for their sponsorship of this program. Also, South Carolina Educational Television for their production of this program and the assistance of the South Carolina Press Association in putting this program on. And I'd be remiss if I, of course, did not welcome our friends in 518 of the Block Building who find this program, Zachary and Associates, others, uh, Representative Merrill and Stavernakis, they find this program very interesting and enlightening, and I hope that you find it the same way they do. With that, what is our program about today? I've got two senators who've been here a little over a year. Right next to my immediate right, is Senator Thomas McElveen. He comes to us from Sumter County. Right next to him, Senator Paul Thurman comes to us from Charleston County. They have been in the Senate a little over a year and they've had a chance now to experience some of the frustration, some of the excitement. I want to talk with them about uh, what, how, how do they perceive it after a year in service. Secondly, what would they like to see done in this session? We're almost halfway through, a little bit of time left. What do they think should be addressed, shouldn't be addressed? And so we're going to take a look where we've been and where are we going. And with that, I'll start with you, Senator. Um, you've been here a little over a year. Uh, what's your impression? What, what's your biggest frustration about serving in the Senate? And what do you think is, is, is the greatest um, reward out of that public service? Well, Governor, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me here today and also Senator, my friend Senator Thurman. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I can tell you, I jumped on the opportunity because yeah, I know that as your days in, in the chamber are somewhat limited, and I think this state and, and our body is really going to miss you. And, uh, Thank you. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, for me, watching as an outsider before I was elected, you know, I see guys like you and Nikki Setzler and Harvey Peeler, some of these giants that have been there for a long time. And it's just it's an honor to serve with you. And um, I just uh, I, I watch you up there, and, and I watch how you work with people, and, and you're a statesman. And, um, Thank you, and sir. I think that this state and this country would be a lot better off if we had more of you. And I think that's what um, folks like that, myself and a Senator from Charleston, Senator Thurman, aspire to. But uh, talking about this year and what I've seen so far, I want to have the conversation about roads and bridges. I see the Senator from Georgetown, Senator Cleary, gets up there every chance he gets and wants to talk about it. I want to talk about it too because it's a problem that I think we addressed, kind of danced around last year, but it's a problem that's not going away and it's something that's, that's got to be done for so many reasons. And, it bothers me that we're almost, well, we're two months into this year's session. We've had a couple ice weeks, but it bothers me that this is something that we're not taking up. We haven't even talked about it yet. Um, that's part of my frustration, of course. The good thing about it is it's a service. Um, I, I do have a, a district that's 
cut in an odd fashion. I have four counties. Yeah, uh, I remember being drawn. Right, yes, sir. <laughs> um, my predecessor kind of had a neat package with Sumter and Lee County, but now I go down from Pinewood, South Carolina, which is down in Sumter County, all the way up to Northeast Richland County, uh, Pontiac and Elgin, Lugolf and Elgin and Kershaw County, and then I kind of wrap around Bishopville and Lee County, but uh, it's a great, it's a great district with great people, and it's just, it's a reward for me to get to serve them. All right. Senator Thurman. Well, Lieutenant Governor, I'd like to echo the statements by the Senator from Sumter regarding uh, your presiding over the Senate and your um, involvement throughout the many years of your service uh, to the state. Um, I had huge shoes to fill. Fortunately, I'm somewhat used to that, I guess. And um, I'm grateful for the people in District 41 to have given me the opportunity to come up here and serve. It is certainly challenging. Uh, there's a lot of information um, to try to take in, to try to understand. Uh, there are politics in politics. Uh, we, what I've quickly learned is trying to, uh, you make relationships, trying to get things done, uh, making sure you can bring a philosophy of consistency, uh, but at the same time understanding that uh, the other 45 senators are not necessarily going to agree with you. Um, as to the issues at hand, we've got a, a bunch. Uh, we seem to have consistently uh, not necessarily looked at the bigger issues for the state. Um, and fortunately, we have some things coming up that I know we're going to have to, to address. Uh, education is, is, uh, has special order right now, a bill for education, Senator Peeler's Read to Succeed bill. Um, I've introduced some things about education, trying to address what I consider uh, poor teachers or teachers that are not performing as they should, at the same time supporting uh, teachers by uh, raising the, the, the average salary for teachers. So in other words, supporting good teachers and addressing uh, underperforming teachers. Um, but we, you know, infrastructure is obviously a big issue. I have to give it to Senator Cleary. He has worked and worked and worked to make sure that that bill is going to have a shot at being debated. I think it needs to be debated. I might have some differences of opinion on how we get to the finish line to address our roads and bridges. But there is no doubt, it is, it is very obvious, a safety concern. It's a quality of life. It's a business economic driver uh, that we need to address for the state. And I'm ready to get to those bigger issues that people, that affect people's lives day in and day out. And I think we'll see that over the next couple months uh, in, the, in, the, in the body. Well, I want to go to those issues and, and we'll take up those since those are issues you all have pointed out. But let me ask you this. I, I look at your backgrounds. Both of you are attorneys. The years I've been up here, we've had less, less, less lawyers coming. So what I would ask you in your first year and a half, your experience of being here in the legislature, has a legal background helped you or hindered you in your ability to deal with legislation? What, what, what's been your experience in that area so that the folks out there can know, because you know everybody likes to say, I don't want to vote for a lawyer, but of course when you need one, everybody loves to get a hold of one. But Legal education, you have a chance to look at consequences and things. Does, do you think it helps you or hurts you? I think it helps, Governor. I mean, I think you've heard me say it on the floor before. One thing I, I've kind of gotten a, a little tired of is, is just these, these shameless attacks on lawyers. Um, <laughs> if a man's been unethical or, you know, or it hasn't been honest in his profession, I think it's fair game. Yeah. But let's not attack people just for being lawyers because lawyers have brought uh, made considerable contributions to the state and to this country. And I think it's, it's a benefit for us, you know, uh, if nothing else, to kind of help wordsmith. We're used to reading the law. We know how the pieces fit together. And we know that words like can, shall, and may can, can really change the meaning of the law. So I mean, I think that, that our background is probably something that, that can help us. Um, my practice has been a general practice of law, kind of varied, and I believe Senator Thurman's law firm is kind of the same way. So I, I think it's something that benefits us. Um, you know, I, I think there's nothing wrong with looking to lawyers when you have legal issues. Just like if we had a, a medical issue, I'd probably look to uh, Senator Cleary, who's, who's our only medical professional in the body. So I, I, think, I think it's a good thing. Well, Your take we, um, you, you know, I, I guess when you're second and you're standing next to a very capable um, senator, you might agree a lot with what he's saying. So <laughs> I agree with the senator from Sumter's position in regards to, to lawyers. I mean, we, we are trained. Um, to, to really look through uh, the, the, the wording and, and what the meaning is and how it might have collateral consequences. Um, I often relate it to a chess match. 
uh, in that you've got to almost look at the, the movements of the, um, of the terms and, and what really is going on or what could be, what could happen? Where is the next move down the road? As lawyers, we're trained in that regard because you've got to anticipate the other side and you've got to anticipate the pushback. Um, but that's not saying that other professions uh, shouldn't be here too. And I think he makes a good point in regards to the doctors. All of us bring something to the table. Uh, one of the most challenging parts that I've, that I've brought to the table is regards to have serving locally and having to address a, a difference with this body and the deliberative body versus local uh, you know, uh, public service where all you have to do is count to five. If you can count to five, you got four other people, you can run it through every day of the week. Here we'll have a 37 to four <laughs> vote and think that, hey, this is great, we got a super majority, and then all of a sudden you'll get a minority report or objection of some sort, and guess what? You gotta figure and you gotta work it out. And that's been a little bit challenging, but, but all of us are bringing something to the table. I certainly think there is a, a need for lawyers in the body, um, but there's a, there's a benefit to all the businesses out there. And frankly, along those lines, one of the things that was early on suggested was reducing the legislative calendar. And one of the reasons why I support that is because I think it would open it up to more people willing to serve, being interested to be in the body, uh, being able to, uh, you know, delineate their time appropriately by their, their full-time job and allowing us to be a part-time job. Certainly, the couple weeks uh, with the ice storm, we realized that, uh, you know, it, it hasn't been totally detrimental. I think Senator Corson has talked about how we, we are on pace, we're moving well. Uh, but those types of things uh, to allow for more, more people to be involved and to, to offer for service, I think, is really important. And hopefully that will be something we take up at some point in the near future as well. Well, let me ask you, and following up on that calendar, because when I was in the Senate, I was against artificially shortening the calendar, and for this reason. The Senate is structured for debate and reflection. I never got a complaint from people about how much time I spent up here. I got a complaint about what we did while we were up here and what we did to them. And sometimes the complaints were unintended consequences. So the failure to read the rules or the regs. So if you compress the time, you have to compress the, de the debate rights, the time spent on stuff, and stuff goes flying through. And then it's very difficult to undo the mistake. And that has always been my concern, that the founders of this country set up government to operate slowly, deliberately and make it very difficult for the legislative branch to get a dictatorship of authority. They split it in half, they gave the governor and the executive branch the veto. And I'm just concerned that legislators, if you want to make more people up here, why the legislature does not increase the pay. It is grossly too low to expect you to come up here and read the volume of material and stuff. And I just think that the legislature tends to take the easy way out and say, we just cut the time when we really need to raise the pay. And it hasn't been raised in so long. And, and, and to me, I mean, that's, so I would ask y'all, what do y'all think? I mean, I know it's, it puts you in a difficult position and people shouldn't judge you that you're trying to pad your own pockets. You cannot raise your pay in your own term of office by the Constitution. Well. And, and in that regard, um, I would just tell you that I've never raised, uh, voted to raise my pay. I will never sit in the body to vote to raise my pay. It's just philosophically, I, I'm offering for service. I recognize that, um, you know, it's, it is uh, not sufficient, so to speak, in regards to if it was a full-time job. But I think the, the founders decided to make this a part-time job, and I think that we need to keep that consistency. I also say that the. Um, you know, how do we move the ball? And, and it, maybe we, we, if we shorten the session, maybe we look at doing a biannual budget. I mean, there's, there are things there that are available. And again, I, I, I agree with you, but when the, when the body gets down to business, we get things done. Sometimes we've got to use the rules to, to, to move that ball forward. But uh, my concern is that as it is structured, um, it, is, it is challenging. We're so fortunate in regards to being a lawyer and we get protection. If we didn't have protection, I'm not so sure I, I would be able to serve. Um, if I didn't have partners in my business, I'm not so sure I'd be able to serve. And again, how do you balance that with the concerns that you have 
with an addition to the desire to create an opportunity for more people to be involved and to offer for service. Um, but I, 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 but you know, when the salary was set at ten thousand dollars, ten thousand was a lot more in purchase power than it is now. Yes, sir. And and, and I guess the case I'm making to two of you, you're young, you got a future ahead of you in the legislature, but you, the legislature is going to starve good people out of coming because it does not offer for part-time service an adequate compensation to keep some of the pressure off of them, so that while they're here. They have the time to look at the bills rather than having to get on the telephones and scramble to make a living at the same time. Well, and I'll, I'll add to that too. You know, I'm certainly not going to go on the record and say we need a pay increase yeah. because, because oh, come on, just like just like Senator Thurman. You know, um, I, I knew what I was getting into when I ran. You know, and I think that, that both of us um, have hearts to serve, and, and public service runs in both of our families. And you know. To me, the job was actually attractive because I don't want to be a full-time politician. I, I like the fact that I'm out in my community, I'm working, um, having the same challenges that the average person has. But to tell you that it's not difficult, it is. You know, and, and I can very get, difficult. And I can get home a lot easier. I, I watched uh, Senator Thurman; he's my desk mate. I have one daughter. He has four children. He he is very devoted to his family and his profession. So it's hard on him, and it's hard it's hard on both of us. But you know, it's it's service. And um, sitting there last year, I think. Both of us in our first year probably got a little frustrated sometimes, the process got bogged down. But then I thought about it, Governor, and what you said is, is right. We're supposed to be the deliberative body. That's, that's, right. that's what the founders intended. Um, we're not supposed to just rifle stuff through. And uh, I don't know who said it, you probably do, but, but I heard the quote that um, I think that someone that served in our body said, if a bill is good enough to pass today, it's good enough to pass tomorrow. That was Senator Grass that used to say well, that. And, and I think there's some truth in that. You know, I yeah. think we do need to look carefully at things and, um, you know, why do we need to pass, we don't need to say any records on passing laws, we need to make sure we're passing good laws. But, um, yeah. And, and that's, and I ask you that because as I become president of the Senate, all of the regulations come to my desk. These agencies are attempting to circumvent the legislative process now. They can't get it through with y'all, they try to write it into a reg. If somebody doesn't read it, if somebody doesn't stand up on the floor and talk about it, that takes time and effort. And if you're under a tremendous compress and pressure to make a living at home and not have some room, the public's getting cheated. And that's uh, my two cents. I know because of where you are, you can't. But if somebody leaving, I can say to the public that you get cheated when you don't make sure that they have enough compensation that they can a devote the time needed because these agencies are spewing this stuff out. I saw one last year take a page and a half bill and turn it into 27 pages of regulations and I had to call the hand on it. I hope the next lieutenant governor reads the stuff like I do. We Quickly these shows go down real fast so <laughs> let me go to both of you. You talked about roads. Let's take up the two subjects you talked about real quick. Roads. We're gliding to gridlock in South Carolina. The roads are crumbling, the interstates are crumbling, we're riding on a previous generation's legacy, the interstate system. What do you think is the reason that it hadn't been able to, to get up and get debated with everybody sitting out there and knowing the road system's collapsing? What's the real problem with getting it at least up for debate? I, I think it's going to be up for debate. I think we're going to see a, a vote very soon on setting it for special order. It's obvious that because of the potential of a gasoline tax, there are a significant amount of members in the body that are not interested in supporting, uh, allowing it to even be debated. I, I bring a little bit different philosophy to that issue. I think that we have to address some of the more challenging um, you know, areas in our state and roads and infrastructure is certainly one of, that, uh, one of those areas. It is absolutely a core function of government. So, how do we get there? I want to have the debate. I'm, I'm in no way, shape, or form agreeing to a gasoline tax. I think it is important for us to talk about how it has not been prioritized throughout the years. I mean, last year alone, I think transportation accounted for maybe 12% of our uh, seven or 6.7 billion um, amount of uh, general fund money. And so, we've got to figure out how we can prioritize it appropriately uh, before we get to let's tax everybody. You know, there's, there, it, and that's a philosophical issue. Uh, do we have the money? Have we appropriately prioritized it? And after that discussion, 
should we then look to alternative options? And what are the al alternative options? Gasoline tax is certainly one. There might be other taxes out there or fees, as they like to call it. Um, but I, I, I believe that it's going to be debated. I think we're going to see it on, set for special order. Uh, or at least have the vote for special order. And then from there, and you know, the other part is, in the discussion, we have to anticipate the governor's veto. So if we're going to spend a lot of time on it, let's make sure it's a productive discussion as opposed to simply passing something that we know is going to get vetoed, it's going to come back to our desk in which the, the veto will likely be sustained if there's the proper numbers. So what I, what I hear you saying is that the veto the, the, the lumen possibility of that, some of the philosophical arguments about taxes and other things complicate it. What's your analysis of, of, of why? That's what I want to say also, Governor. I think, that, I think that our governor has put us in somewhat of a box here by speaking in absolutes and saying, I will not endorse a gas tax. Right. Because in my estimation, the votes are not there in the House to override that. Um, I'm, I've heard you talk about it before. and. When you talk about 30 billion needed dollars over 20 years, we can't do that from our general fund. It just won't work. And I don't know of any way to do this other than to pass a, a long overdue gas tax. I will say this, I will not support a gas tax until the formula changes on how we, on how we do the funding. Because I can tell you right now, you know, I'm sitting between two gentlemen from Charleston, you get yours, uh, Horry County gets theirs and Greenville gets theirs. My four counties are in shambles. We, we need a lot. And, I think one thing that's hurt us is the way we have our highway commission set up. Um, I think if we were still in, in the old way of doing it by judicial circuit, we'd be in a lot better shape. My home county right now, Sumter, we're split between the 5th fifth, fifth, uh, Congressional District and 6th District. We have one commissioner in Gaffney, one in Columbia. Um, I look at the infrastructure bank, it's frustrating to me. They, they, they've spent and bonded, I think, $4 billion in the last 17, 18 years. My counties have gotten pretty much nothing. So I think it's unrealistic to think that we can fund this, this, this problem um, without raising the gas tax, but out of the other side of my mouth, I would say I want to make sure my district's getting some of that because that's who I'm here to represent. Well, for what it's worth, uh, when the State Infrastructure Bank was set up, a group of us said you should never require a local match because you froze the rural counties and the poor counties we, we out of the bank, we and it, it was wrong. That, and, and I agreed with that. Um, but that was the politics of the day. And then some of them who were opposed to it immediately went and got the money. Um, all that having been said in the world of politics, that's what happens. So in a nutshell, I would ask the two of you, the general fund, you know, I see this attempt to so-called get money out of the general fund. General fund has trimmed back higher education now till tuition is out of sight. We're creating a generation of debtors. We haven't been able to make the education formulas. We haven't been able to keep up the court system. We've had to heap fees and fees. Do you really, do you think some of these people argue the general fund should now, which was never set up to handle roads, should now get into the road business when it can't even keep up what it's got? Well, I think my point is that last year we saw approximately $120 million in earmarks that were from the general fund. Stuff like funding of a a library in Union to the tune of 1.25 million. Um, that really is local government. Coming from local government, that should be local government's responsibility. And it wasn't. It was an earmark. And we saw a significant amount of those. So again, the, the issue is not, um, is it automatically going to get resolved by the general fund? The issue is, we need to prioritize the general fund to start with. And then from there, if, there, if it turns out that, that's, that we have to look to other alternatives, what are those other alternatives? Is the only option a gasoline tax? The irony is, and I think Thomas and I probably understand this the best, is it's a declining revenue source. Yeah. All indications are that the gasoline tax is going to decline because cars are getting more, more efficient. They've got to be more efficient. Is it fair also? I mean, we talk about a user fee. Is it really a user fee? When you think about all the cars that are now getting on the roads in regards to electric type cars, they don't, they don't pay that user fee. So my point is that I'm all for the discussion. And I really want to start the discussion by addressing what I consider inappropriate spending to start with. And then let's get to that, the meat of the, the issue. But, and I think the governor actually agrees with us. She, she referred to it as money tree, which I don't, I don't know if that's a good one to refer to it as, but you know, it gets the perspective that there's a lot out there 
that is not really being utilized. Last thing I want to say, and I don't mean to take all the time associated with this. You're doing good. But thanks. <laughs> but but what we heard over and over again coming into this body for the first time was the term restore. You know, we had this downturn, and it was very challenging. But a downturn required government to be responsible. It required government to act appropriately and look through where it was spending money and whether or not it really should be spending it on that. And then all of a sudden as things have turned around, you hear these bureaucrats come and say, we've got to restore this funding. We have to get back. No, no you don't. That, that is a total misconception. Okay? There are core issues of government that we need to make sure we fund. Obviously education, obviously infrastructure, obviously law enforcement. But we don't necessarily need to restore things that were wasteful. And that's, I think, we have a great opportunity in a, the little bit of the DOA bill um, that I agreed with was the fact that we're going to audit and we're going to review and we're going to look for waste. And I think we have an opportunity to really try to make sure that we're spending the taxpayer money appropriately. I, I agree with that, that oversight function. We've got less than two Sorry. minutes left. I want you to have a chance to get you a bite to in here, too, of what you see. Well, I think, I think one thing we need in the state is, is Department of Transportation overhaul. We can't discuss that in two minutes. But, <laughs> but I think when we have this discussion, and he's right, uh, get the gas tax would be a declining source of revenue. But I think when we have this discussion, we need to put it all on the table, whether it's, it's an increased gas tax. And a lot of that money does come from out-of-state people who will be paying for, for our roads and our bridges, which is attractive to me. Let's look at toll roads. Let's look at everything and see what the best options are. But our general fund, you know, no one wants to raise taxes. I, mean, I don't think anybody in this body wants to do that. But our general fund over the last decade has not even grown with inflation. We can't keep scooping off to the tune of $30 billion over 20 years. When, when we're not funding uh, public education adequately, not funding higher ed adequately, it just won't work. The dollars aren't there, the formula's not there. So I think we need to have this discussion, spend as much time as we can on it, and, and let's find a solution. Well, one of the things that's uh, bothered me has been some of the work I've seen out there on the highways and some of this resurfacing. I don't have time to go into it, mm -hmm. but I saw a stretch of resurfacing where they already got patches on it after about 120 days. Who in the world is checking on what? I don't know. Um, very quickly, we're just about out of time. I want to thank both of you. you. You've given our viewers an opportunity to see it from somebody who's just fresh in here. Uh, some of my questions aim from somebody who's been here a while. Uh, but uh, uh, got a lot of issues ahead, and I hope we have a chance. We never got into the education issue that we wanted to discuss today. Um, I would just tell you, is there any parting remark? Because we got to go. We're out of time. I want to thank both of you for being with us. And we'll thank be you. back next week, this week in the State House, as we deal with other topics coming up here in the General Assembly. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by Time Warner Cable. Online at timewarnercable.com. And by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org.